Will you be remembered after you're dead? The Zedless Deadless podcast about obscure people from history with me, Izzy Lawrence. Hello and welcome to the Zedless Deadless. I am Izzy Lawrence and ooh, I, I love this episode. It is literally just me and Natalie Haynes having a chat um, about her book, which is magnificent and really makes me question all of the, um, well, the morality that I actually have. I've been doing that a lot recently. I was on BBC Sunday Live, which is terrifying doing live television. It is, I I sat down and I didn't get to meet the presenter beforehand. So we just sat down in the room with him and he is the most beautiful man you've ever seen. Hi, Sean. But he is. On TV, he just looks like a normal TV, you know, handsome presenter. But when you, when you actually sit down opposite him and you're looking at him and your brain just goes, I don't think, I think he might have an inner divinity which was, you know, tricky as we were talking about inner divinities because we were talking about um, uh, the lack of religion in modern society and how very few people are going to church. Now, I think they got me on as an atheist to sort of say, well, this is a very good thing. But I thought that'd be a bit mean. And considering most of the people who watch that show are religious, I thought, well, let's just try and solve this problem and work out different ways that would get me to go to church, Uh, which was so it was quite a fun conversation. But it did make me think how much of my morality is incredibly Judeo-Christian, how I am all about the meek inheriting the earth, inheriting the myrrh. Yeah. Oh, I need more coffee. But I am all about, you know, saving, you know, you know, sacrificing yourself for other people and all of those big morals that you see in Hollywood films, which are very Judeo-Christian because a pagan would say, no, the strongest people are the bestest. And those are the people that you need to sing about, which is what me and Natalie Haynes um, end up talking about quite a lot. Her book, A Thousand Ships, is incredible. It's one of these books that if you're I will say, do not read this book if you were planning on writing your own book, because you'll just give up. I, I'm currently going through different stages of writing different pitches for different projects. And um, yeah, I wish I hadn't read it because I just feel like, well, that's no good compared to this. However, um, Natalie is one of these people who's incredibly down to earth and just happy to chat about stuff, which is what we do. So I think if you're not very aware of the story of Troy, and some of you might not be, but um, basically what happens is Paris kidnaps a girl from Sparta, not so kidnaps, he seduces a girl from Sparta called Helen, takes her back to Troy. The Spartans get all the Greeks to go to Troy to try and get her back. The siege lasts about 10 years and in the end is won because they trick into taking into Troy a wooden horse which is actually filled with Greeks. Now that's the very basic story. One of the reasons that Paris goes to Sparta and falls in love with Helen though is the story of the golden apple because what happens is three goddesses Aphrodite, Hera and Athene find this golden apple. They all claim that it is theirs because on it is the inscription to the most beautiful and Zeus is asked by the goddesses to say, well, who's the apples for? Who's the prettiest of us? And one of them is his daughter. And one of them is like, you know, his wife. And one of them, he, Zeus has sex with everybody. So basically Zeus doesn't want to pick because he doesn't want to start an argument. So he gets a little goat herder called Paris to pick. And Paris picks Aphrodite. Aphrodite, in return, gives him uh, the most beautiful woman the face that launched a thousand ships, which I believe is a quote from Dr. Faustus. might be actually a direct quote from the poetry. Who knows? Uh, um, Well, Natalie probably would. So enjoy this conversation with me and Natalie at the Hampstead Theatre and read the book. It will blow your mind or or don't or don't and just enjoy the thought of what is a hero? What is an Amazon? And should she really have called her book Helen back because her name's Helen and she went she went there and back so Helen back okay I, I I did end up naming this episode Troy Story though which I'm very proud of very proud the main the main purpose of this podcast is to get you to buy Natalie Haynes's book A Thousand Ships and read it because it is genuinely amazing and I am slightly overwhelmed how you managed to get your head around it thanks it, no, it, yeah it was a killer this one I think it says in the acknowledgements that this book was a man eater well you said that at, on yeah, your, you, you, at your launch yeah. sort of, you were like on a balcony I was just, just being like guys no yeah. no <laughs> it, was, it was a lot this one yeah I mean the the structure of it is quite 
complicated because mm. it changes perspective so often. But essentially it was really easy to keep track of because I know these stories so well and I was doing so much research into them. And the central kind of spine of the book was always intended to be essentially Euripides Trojan women, the mm. Euripides play Trojan women. And then I wanted to follow them through to their kind of end results, the women who, you know, we only get 90 minutes of them in Euripides, it's not it's 1400 lines long as a, or maybe 1500 lines long as a play. So I wanted to kind of follow all their consequences right the way through to the end. So I knew that was happening, but I also wanted to do the causation timeline of the war backwards, because I thought that would be kind of cool that you'd be like, that the book would start with the Trojan horse, yeah. that would start with the fall of Troy, spoiler. Um, and then <laughs> you'd basically find out the consequences of that running forwards and yeah. the causes of that running backwards. But everybody else was like, are you sure? And you're, yeah, yeah, no, I can definitely do it. It was the emotional heft that was so difficult. It's a very funny book as well, because the gods are hilarious. The gods were most fun to write. They yeah. so funny. The, yeah, some of it's really sad, but the what, gods were a lot of fun. Their scene with Paris was it's, lovely. It was yes. a joy to write that. <laughs> and they're straight, again, they're straight out I believe, of the I, I, I was on the train and I was reading it, and there's a bit where the, god, the goddesses try to prove their sexiness. And, and, and I think it's Hera um, just drops her clothes and yes. Athene just goes, oh, oh we're we doing, doing this now. <laughs> yeah. No, I do read it I sometimes at events, laugh. but then yeah. I get slightly pervy men coming onto me afterwards, so it's a bit of a risky well, you're strategy. Not, you're, not, you're not a goddess, no offence. No, well, yeah. quite, but if you read it, then that's yeah. all that it takes, it turns out. They just need to hear about naked ladies, and that's... Well, this this is, is the way of the weird man. This is the thing. Now, the way of the weird man, this is the whole thing. The histories of these women have been completely ruined in some respects. In some respects, by yeah. By men Well, sometimes just lost. Um, mm. You know, Euripides, obviously my not even very secret favourite, um, wrote eight tragedies which survive to us today about the Trojan War, seven of them have women as the title characters. Only one, Orestes, doesn't. So in terms of putting women's stories kind of front and centre, when, when journalists asked me when this book came out, you're like, isn't it anachronistic to put, yeah, I don't know, do you want me to go back in time and tell Euripides? Because I'm pretty <laughs> sure he didn't mind. But it's certainly true that women don't get much of a say in, for example, the Iliad. They do a bit better in the Odyssey. Um, but Brizis, the war bride, um, who's who's moving around and ownership and contested ownership um, is it motivates the whole of the Iliad. She gets 14 lines in book 19. There's a talking horse in book 19, it gets 10 lines, so it's not, <laughs> not a tremendously good representation. Although, as I always say when I'm on stage, women, 40% more interesting than a talking horse? I mean, yeah. it's a bit of a reach, I admit. I, I think, uh, to be honest, I mean, I don't know many men more interested <laughs> than a talking horse. I, I mean, it's I mean, a talking, not only know. that, can it can briefly predict the future, so it's quite a good one, but Excellent. yeah. <laughs> For 10 lines only, enchanted by Hera, Xanthus the talking horse. Nice, and and what I particularly, I mean, this is obviously for the Zedless Deadless podcast, so we need to pick out a few really key people. The one that I really, because I knew nothing about, because literally you can um, take my knowledge of the ancient worlds because I did geography at university. And Tusk. Did, and did See, I did no geography because I did Greek. You had to choose between German, Greek, ancient Greek, and geography at my school, really? and clearly I went ancient Greek. I would have so geography in that. I, so. I see that. Because I, I couldn't have done, like, oh, oh, the Greek's hard, German's really hard because you've got dirty, dusty, danger, dusty, three genders, can't cope. Ha, 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 you think German is hard. <laughs> let, let me introduce you to Greek, which has 24 words for the letter, for the word the. Um, wow. And indeed, in terms of tenses, it has the future tense, mm -hmm. present tense, perfect tense, imperfect tense, pluperfect tense, strong aorist, weak aorist. It has the singular and the plural, but also the dual for when two people do things. It is madness, Greek. What? German is quite a lot like Latin. Greek is crazy town. You should, have, you should have just done German. I love Greek. I love it. I'm much better at it than I am at Latin, I think. Um, I find Latin easier to read, but harder to, to translate. It's, it's one of these things that I found out recently which really entertained me was that it was very likely that all the, you know, Julius Caesar was chatting to his friends in Greek. Yeah, his final words were in Greek. Kaisu technon, we're told in uh, Suetonius, I think. Um, you too, my child. That's what he says to Brutus. So, yeah, he'd been having an affair with Brutus's mother for ages. So much so that there were rumours that he was Brutus's actual father, although it's very unlikely to be true. But, yeah, I, it, it really bothers me that everybody thinks his last words were et tu, Brute, because, of course, it's a nice moment in Shakespeare, mm. but it has no Oedipal resonance, whereas Kaisu Technon, wow, that really hurts, doesn't it? Yeah. It's mythology, isn't it? You're killed by your children. That's... Yeah, very much so. It's, it's, it's a really interesting thing. I was talking to somebody about this the other week, that the... The male fear of castration, which runs through every myth cycle that I can find, really, and every 
worldview, or it certainly seems to. Um, in terms of the Greeks, it's almost always about being castrated by your son. You know, mm. it's Zeus and Kronos and Uranus and all of those people, and it's like, hmm, I wonder why that's the obsession. Well, they're, they're, they're very tender bits. Yeah, but I mean, in later, in later thought, it's usually women that that castration fear is aimed at rather than your own child. Okay. Just seems interesting to me. Mm. I don't particularly have anything to, you know... Add to it. No, I'm not sure I do, just that it's an oddity and worth noticing that the fear of being castrated by women doesn't seem to come up at all, really, in Greek myth, but the idea that you'll be castrated by your son, pretty big deal. It's weird, the obsessions that, you know, go through it all. I can't say it because you, your book really explores which gods actually is the result, you know, the Trojan War is the result yes. of, and it's very conspiratorial. I love it that. It is very conspiratorial, and I, I didn't yeah. invent that. So I know, but I love yeah, the way you explained right it because I didn't know that, and it was yeah. really cool finding it out. The it way is you really it. cool. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, no, I think it's really cool too because you kind of go, well, most of us know that the golden apple, yeah. you know, appears in the story that says Tecaliste for the most beautiful woman on it because obviously it has the feminine ending because it's Greek, um, and then Paris is sort of plucked out of... Yeah, I mean, Zeus doesn't want to have to choose between them, so he kind of sequesters Paris to do it. And chaos eventually will ensue, because obviously in, in preferring one, he inevitably has to make lifelong enemies of the other two. And, you know, these goddesses have, and indeed the, the gods as well, have absolutely, you know, immortal lives to maintain a grudge. They, It's a blink of an eye to it's them. It's the only, only thing that they do, it seems. Uh, I mean, pretty much, yeah. If you want to imagine the Greek gods if you don't know anything about them just imagine if you've ever watched gossip girl or you know one of these um like modern day soap operas where it's all about who's in position and who's the you know yeah. most preferred and how to get somebody to do something by manipulation yeah and it's with incredible Greek. petulance yeah yeah i mean i took them from um euripides hippolytus which doesn't cover the trojan war but obviously tells the story of hippolytus um, who is the stepson of theseus um, and at the beginning of that play, Aphrodite walks out on stage and she says, I'm going to destroy Hippolytus because he hasn't shown me enough respect. And what she means is he is chaste. I mean, T-E, obviously not E-D, uh, otherwise he would be more <laughs> like Benny Hill. Um, and so in other words, he's not having sex with anybody, not with girls and not with boys. He prefers spending his time with other young men, but he's not having sex with anybody and she doesn't like it. And so she says, fine, I'm going to destroy him. And she doesn't care who else she kills or, you know, injures beyond repair on the way to doing that. That's her sole goal. And, you know, en route, she destroys Phaedra, who's done nothing, who's only been, you know, good to her. She just doesn't care at all. And then at the end of the play, just when you might think, well, sufficient trauma has now been wrought that we can say that we've all learned a lesson, then Artemis, who's, uh, and Hippolytus was her favorite, who is, she sees herself as sort of oppositional to Aphrodite. She walks out on stage and says, well, she killed one of mine, I'm gonna kill one of hers. Oh, no. And it's like, <laughs> wow, guys. Really, but there, it, it, there's something incredibly empowering slash delightful about writing such appalling women. Because you realise, <laughs> you know, even when, you're, even when you write like female villains, which I have occasionally done in the past, um, there's still that sort of sense that they feel like they're judged by society. Because yeah. they are, because women are judged, you know, at, at least in terms of their appearance or their desirability all the time. And I know men are now more than ever, I think, as well, but that sense that you might just not care is so rare to attach to the female experience. So yeah, writing a bunch of women, because obviously there are a bunch of goddesses in this book who just were like, with absolutely no concern for other people who can behave as badly as they want. There are humans in the book who get revenge. I'm thinking, I'm thinking yeah. Hecabee? Hecabee yeah. gets a hell of a revenge. That's amazing. Right? Yeah, I wrote my dissertation on women who kill children. Um, uh, I don't have children, don't write in. Um, so I wrote a comparative study of Euripides, Medea and Hecabee. And obviously Medea, again, not in this story. She's part of the Argonautic cycle. Uh, but Hecabee very much is. And her revenge in it is that play is one of the most extraordinary, distressing mm. revenges that y you will ever see on stage, I think. I mean, it's just mesmerizing. They read about it in the book. They can read about it in the book. Yeah. yeah or go and see a production of Hecabee if you get the chance. So let, let, us, let us, if we're going to ruin one story all the way through for the readers, I think it should be the Amazon Queen. And I can Pantasalea, because she comes in early. Yes, yeah. she does come in early. And I think she's, um, she's really interesting because she's not Trojan and she's yes. not Greek and she's not a god. That's true. So it's, she, she stands out for that reason. Yeah. And also she has cool clothes. She has great clothes, which yeah. are entirely lifted from 
Greek vase painting because it's one of, again, one of these things where we kind of tend to assume, or I guess maybe I mean I kind of tend to assume, that women have always been sidelined um, or not you know, considered the centre of the story other than in work by Euripides and actually also Ovid who wrote um, a set of poems called the Heroides, which are letters from abandoned women and wives to their absent menfolk and sometimes those men are gods and they are absolutely brilliant. That's where I stole the idea from the Penelope letters from. Um, but Penthesilea is a really interesting point because if you look at surviving Greek vase painting now, um, Mythological characters are a really popular theme to have on those vast paintings. Often they're scenes from actual tragedies that had been performed, but equally often they're just, you know, a scene from a Greek tragedy that maybe the tragedy that we don't have anymore, or it's just from a Greek myth that, yeah, there wasn't a play, it's just a cool moment. <laughs> and so, by far and away, the most popular character we can see on Greek vase painting is Heracles, which I reckon is probably for two reasons. One is that he's a hyper-masculine ideal. He's always going around drinking and shagging. And obviously men are buying pottery because they're the ones who are allowed to trade in Athens. And, and women aren't. And good. And yeah. He's got the muscles. Mm. And he's, got, he's very easy to identify, which is actually, I'm not really joking, another reason probably for his high so appearance yeah. count, because yeah. we can say it's definitely him because he's holding a club and a, an animal skin, whereas it's a bit harder to identify you know, Oedipus unless he's in front of a sphinx or um, Theseus unless he's in front of a minotaur. Um, so Hercules, Heracles, is, um, his Greek name Heracles, his Roman name Hercules, is always really easy to ID. But the second most popular Greek myth characters to find on vases were Amazons. And it's like, how did we lose that? And, you know, how did we lose the idea of the warrior woman being central to our artistic culture because we definitely have when you know Buffy the Vampire Slayer came along it felt like a huge mold breaking moment it's like wait girls get to fight as well what? are you sure you know and before her obviously we had things like Wonder Woman but they were pretty few and far between it, it amazes me because I've been researching my own book which is about the suffragettes who actually trained right and they fought and they really injured people yeah <laughs> like some policemen never came back to work so it's like, you know, because they Impressive swung Impressive work, clubs. suffragettes. Yeah, indeed. And they were, you know, properly trained as well. But even at that time, it was in all the papers. All these women can think they can fight and here's a joke type yeah. thing. But, you know, it, it just gets forgotten, now, huh? yeah. gets forgotten again and again and again. Yes, doesn't it, though? Yeah. It's, I guess it's just one of those battles we have to keep rehaving. Yeah. But, I mean... But, this, she, but sorry. the Amazons themselves, because we, we're vaguely, you know, aware of them. But yes, it's, but it's nowhere near as aware of no. them as they were in the ancient world, for sure. So if you look at the vase paintings that we have of them, they're, I mean, again, we're kind of guessing at, at the motivation for their popularity. But um, as you correctly identified, they have cool clothes they and they get to wear kind of um, tight leggings and basically like a mini dress over the top, um, which is very different from the chiton, the sort of shapeless shift dress that most Greek women would have worn. So when men, and it is only men, are at least only men that we have any record of, um, are buying these pots and you know, painting, designing these pots and so on, then I think it's probably fair to say there's an element of mm, sexy lady going on because, you yeah, know, there they are in their tight fighting gear as opposed to a shapeless dress. And you kind of think, well, yeah, you can definitely see there's certainly an element of kind of exoticization. The Amazons are other um, because they're not Greek. So what do we know about them? Where did they, where did they come from? There's an excellent book by Adrian Mayer, which I would very much recommend, Adrian E W N E, um, uh, called Amazons Ancient and Modern, I think. And um, she suggests that they come from the steppe. So they're, okay. you know, so essentially so you put Russia. Aren't you? Yeah, Scythian, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, they they range quite broadly because obviously they're nomadic. Um, and so, yeah, the the moment when Amazons sort of shift from being myth to reality is pretty hard to place. Um, but it seems to have been the case that there were at least observable warrior women coming from somewhere to the north. Um, and that that's, you know, either they then become the kind of Amazons of myth or the two sort of overlap in one way or another. And that's how we end up with this image of them, these incredible fighting women who are super fit and, you know, ride horses and don't seem to, you know, ever be particularly concerned about their own safety. Um, the great myth, of course, about Amazons is, a, is false etymology, even in time. Greeks love etymology and they love making it up. Um, and so the... You know, as you'll see from, if you look at any pots uh, with Amazons on, you can see an absolutely beautiful one of Penthesilea and Achilles in the British Museum, which I'm pretty much certain is part of their Troy exhibition this autumn, which starts in November. 
um, and runs through till maybe February or March. Um, you can if you, find out all about that in the British Museum member cards. Ta-da! <laughs> um, but if you um, have a look at those pots, you'll see that these Amazons are entirely unmutilated. And yet people still ask me at shows now, but isn't it true that the Amazons cut off one breast so they could more easily fight? No, it's a false etymology. It comes from making the word Amazon um, derive from a mastos, meaning without a, and mastos breast, which is uh, where we get a word like mastitis, for example, or mastectomy. Um, and it, it's just it's just not a true etymology. It's just the Greeks making up nonsense. They love doing it. <laughs> so you you picked um, oh, so say a name, Penthesilea. Penthesilea. It's yes. A, you see, I'm one of these people who, when I read um, Harry Potter, it wasn't until the end I realised she was called Hermione, not Hermione. One. Aww. So, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people who Aww. just goes, I recognise that word and I don't say it in my head yeah, to see yeah. the person. I think loads of yeah. us do it with um, other languages as well. I find like it a Siobhan. huge struggle with um, Russian names, where it's like, I'm going to really be processing the first and the last. But also with Russian novels, then almost always people have like three or four different readings of their name. So there are Alexander, but also Sasha, but also, and you go, ah, I'm struggling enough <laughs> to keep up with And yeah, it's just the way of it now. Cool. So, um, uh, yeah, so she, mm. right, she appears and she's there to, um, she basically accidentally, uh, I'm going to ruin this part, this is the only part of the book I'm ruining. So That's all right, it's right near the start. So she, she basically, when she's a kid, kills her sister. She does. Sister. Hippolyta, who people maybe know from other bits of Greek myth, and of course she appears in um, Midsummer Night's Dream. So she doesn't always, that's the thing with myth, it doesn't do what you expect. There's never a, you know, people again, it's one of those questions that comes up a lot, but aren't you changing the myth? You go, well, yeah, but so is literally everyone who's ever written it. <laughs> so it's always changing. There is no right version. So yeah, and one version of their story, Penthesilea accidentally kills Hippolyta. Um, and she- So a catching out. Which yeah. is so sensible. It's not a very sensible <laughs> thing to do, is it? Yeah, no, it's not very sensible. She accidentally shoots her. I think the catching arrows thing, I, yeah. Um, I, the, again, the problem with these stories when you find them is that sometimes it's like half a sentence and you're like, oh, guys, give me some more detail. But the good news as a novelist, of course, is that you can then come up with it. It's like, how would she accidentally shoot her sister? Nice. Yeah, well, because they would be testing themselves against the fastest thing they could have against the flight of an arrow. That's that seemed to me obvs. like the well. That seemed to me like the obvious. But yes, I, I acknowledge it as a yeah, it's, it's a choice. Nice. It's nice. Um, but yeah, it comes up elsewhere sometimes. You kind of go, how is that? How can you just give me one you know three word phrase about something as interesting as this? But they've moved on. You know, they're not interested in this particular bit of the story. And so, so your mm. interpretation is she's absolutely distraught and she needs to die in battle yes. she decides this is this yeah, is and so she thing. joins the Trojan War she does so she rides south um, to join Troy and in my version of her she is she only picks Troy rather than Greece because the Greeks have, have the better warrior in Achilles and he is more likely to be able to kill her because um, yeah, she's that good yeah, because she's that good, and it's a suicide mission. Exactly. Um, well, Achilles, because Achilles is the his dad is Peleus, and his mum's normal. Uh, no, the other no, way around. Peleus, Peleus is Peleus, Peleus is mortal, normal. and Thetis is a sea nymph. Yeah. And that and the sea nymph, and that's why he's so quick. He is extremely fast. Yeah, swift-footed Achilles is what Homer tends to call him, um, amongst other things. And also, you know, his mother Thetis is so kind of appalled by having to marry a mortal man that yeah, we have this idea of um, the, the notion of the Achilles heel comes because Thetis either dips Achilles into the waters of the river Lethe, I think, um, and the only bit that doesn't get sort of rendered bulletproof is the bit she's holding him by, namely the foot. Um, but there's another version of the story where she kind of burnishes him in a fire to try and burn out all the wow. mortal elements of him. So, yeah, it's, she's You wouldn't be as pretty then. I mean, it's hard to say, isn't it? She's monstrous in lots of ways too, Thetis. Um, again, a goddess who's right from the very you know, early part of her story is thwarted by stronger gods. Mm. Yeah, you need to be careful she's, with she's her. She's a bit sulky. She so. is sulky, but actually, if you read the Iliad, um, the gods, even, you know, big gods like Zeus, really don't, they don't take her, her lightly at all. In book one of the Iliad, when Achilles withdraws from battle, he prays to Thetis and says, make the Trojans win. Go to Zeus and make the Trojans win because the Greeks have slighted me. And to us, that's treason. Right? Because these men were his comrades in arms a minute ago and he's happy to see them die. Um, you know, it's, it's not the only vision of masculinity in the Iliad by a long chalk, but it's probably the most toxic, that he genuinely doesn't care for his male comrades at all, so long as his own honor has been slighted. He just doesn't care. Compare that with Patroclus, who heals the men who come back from the front line injured. And you see a very different 
vision of masculinity is something a lot more caring, um, which I think is interesting. But then at the very end of the Iliad, spoiler, um, the gods all get together to decide what should happen to the body of Hector. And Zeus says, well, we're, you know, we're going to sort of sort this out, but we need to run it by Thetis first. And it's wow. like, OK, so the king of the gods has to check with a sea nymph before he can make this work. So she's quite a badass on the quiet, yeah. Thetis. She gets... She gets more of her own way after, you know, the initial having to marry Peleus, which she doesn't want. She gets more of her own way than you would think. So yes, Penthesilea decides she must come to fight in the Trojan War and the better course of action for her is to fight on the Trojan side so she can fight Achilles. Um, and she does. And she does, and it's a relatively short battle, yes. uh, which he wins, spoiler. Um, and it's at this point that I would remind everybody that literally everyone who faces Achilles in the Iliad, unless they are rescued by a god, dies. Yeah. And that includes Hector, um, who is the great, you know, that's the phrase great that was translated, warrior. bulwark of the Trojans. He is the greatest Trojan warrior. And he fights, He, when he is brought face to face with Achilles in book 22 of the Iliad, he runs away, not metaphorically, actually, he literally runs away and he runs around the city walls. And then the goddess Athene comes down in disguise. She's disguised as one of his male friends. And she says, stand your ground, I'll support you. Mm -hmm. And so he stops and turns, stands his ground, and she disappears, and he realizes he's been tricked. And the duel is vanishingly brief. Um, it, it's over in seconds, because Achilles is the greatest warrior the world has ever known. That's just what it is. So sometimes when I talk about this in schools, I ask them <laughs> say, about... How would you kill your friend? I say, well, what makes a hero in this story? Yeah. Um, because... You know, sometimes it's having a, a god as a parent, like Achilles does, but Hector doesn't, um, and nor does Odysseus, although he has the favour of Athene. He's not related to... And, and it's presented as a sort of point against Hector amongst the gods. Here it says, I don't know why you care about him when he doesn't have, you know, divine parentage. Mm. But he's definitely a hero. Is it, you know, being really good at fighting? Like I say, literally everybody who fights Achilles right. loses. Is it caring about your comrades? Obviously not, or Achilles, and so on and so on. And, you know, by any sort of term other than you have to be a man that you can come up with, Penthesilea is as heroic as anyone. Mm. Is it... I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to say this because... I did, did... Were there Amazons? We don't really know, is the short answer. I think we'd probably say yes, not least because there are examples of warrior women fighting all over the world. And this is something we've only really been able to prove in about the last 10 years, where DNA testing has become so much more sophisticated that if you look at mass warrior graves in all kinds of places, up to maybe a third of the bones belong to women in some of those mass warrior graves. And it's like, what? You know, we've spent our whole kind of historical thinking lives thinking this was men fighting and women, you know, at home in the camp doing laundry but that's clearly not the case because like I say up to a third and we've only been able to to say this with any certainty in the last decade or so it's such a huge shift so it would be weird if there weren't Amazons insofar as women have definitely fought you know they fought in Scandinavia they fought in mainland Europe it would be weird if they didn't also fight on the Russian steppe and down to Turkey it would be strange particularly when you have things like you know bow and arrows yeah well which quite which really level strong. things out yeah and also it would be weird if the image of almost always you can see with a mythological character or creature the sort of origin of it so you can tell with dragons that people are scared of snakes or reptiles and that's where dragons come from you can tell almost always with greek monsters they're a sort of composite of a person and an animal and you can see how these kinds of things developed over you know people telling stories around fires at night and you can look at things like um, gorgon heads gorgonea is what the isolated heads are called um, and and it seems very plausible that they are um, designed as a sort of way of um, reflecting and repelling our fears about wild animals. You know, she has snakes for hair. If you look at a, a gorgon with her hair in full kind of curl, she looks a bit like a lion. If you sleep outside in the dark, you can see how these are things you'd be frightened oh, of. Yes. So you can generally tell. It would be weird if Amazons just came out of nowhere in, into this story. It would be more likely that, you know, warrior women were seen fighting on horseback with bows and arrows and they either actually are a tribe of warrior women or they they inspire one um, one way or the other so yes definitely some women fighting of some sorts yes definitely killed by actual gods i mean that would be the nicer way around for sure <laughs> yeah excellent as you were saying earlier about what makes a hero and everything else is there really is no morality here 
it's such a different morality from ours, yeah. certainly. That I mean, you have to kind of stop for a minute and say, and remove that kind of Judeo-Christian thinking from your so mindset. Hard. Well, yeah. yes. I mean, luckily for me, I've never been religious, um, and I have been interested in the Greeks and the Romans since I was 11. So I've had quite a lot of time of thinking in those, yeah, yeah, in those terms. So I try not to come unstuck with right and wrong in the same way. Yeah. Um, but yes, it, it's a very different moral code. So for us. Achilles is definitely treasonous. Um, and he's also not very heroic. You know, he's got 24 books of the Iliad. He spends 19 of them sulking. Yeah, well, you know. um, he doesn't do any fighting. He's the greatest warrior the world has ever known. He spends 19 books eating, bitching with his friends, playing the liar and complaining to his mother. It's like, I've dated that guy. I'm not sure he is a hero. But there's no question in Homer that we're questioning that heroism at all. It's just not there. Even when he turns around and says, that's it, if you're going to slight me by taking away the you know, woman I won as a prize, obviously these aren't my values, they are the values of Bronze Age Greece. If you're going to um, take away my prize, then I'm refusing to fight. That's not presented at any point as being um, a sign of weakness in his character. It's presented as, as well, of course. Yeah. You know, he's a hero, so you have to treat him like a hero. And actually, if you can't have if, if you don't have writing, and this story is before writing, there's a mention of um, symbols in a story in, I think it's in the Iliad rather than the Odyssey, about Bellerophon and sort of how untrustworthy these symbols are. It's a, a very, very early reference to writing of some sort. There's linear A and linear B exist at, at this time, but alphabetic writing won't come until about the sixth century, I think. Um, then it's much harder to kind of conserve your fame. Mm. And if you, if you live in a time when the only way you can be immortal is to have people sing your story, then being great is more important than being good. Um, we may not see that value system ourselves, but it is, it's undeniably there. But you would argue that more people you save, and the more people you have on your side, and you know, you go down, I suppose it's only if they win. Yeah, but that's, that's a, again, that's a very kind of Judeo-Christian yeah, mindset. The more people you save, well, why? You know? So they can sing your song. But if you were really, if you were a tremendous killing machine like Achilles, everyone's going to sing your song anyway. That's true. I mean, Odysseus, let's remind ourselves, is the least successful Greek hero in terms of returning home. Yeah. I mean, every single spoiler Ithacan who goes to the Trojan War doesn't come home except for Odysseus. Literally wow. one out of all the Ithacans make it home. He manages to lose or get killed everyone else he goes with. And it's like, well, if we're... If we're judging heroism in terms of how many people you save, Odysseus would not do well out of this. And, and yet he gets his, his own whole poem. He gets yeah. a whole 24 book poem. So, and a word I mean, after him, an odyssey. For yeah. example. Yeah. So yeah, I think, I mean, Odysseus is a really difficult case study for us because like, he's genuinely quite bad at being a hero. He has really good ideas, but then he opens his big mouth and screws them up. Um, he can't achieve something without telling everyone about it, which always puts him in danger. He's a compulsive liar. He doesn't save anybody else and he doesn't have a divine parent. How is he a hero? But he is one, yeah. so, well, he's, you know. he get, he get, he's, he's exciting. He is exciting and maybe that's enough. The best answer I've had to this question from anybody was a, a boy in a school in Manchester when we'd been talking about this for about five or six minutes and he said, I think a hero is um, somebody who can persuade other people to call them a hero. And I was like, you know, that's a good enough answer that I'm not yeah. sure I can tell you you're wrong. Because, yeah, if, if everyone thinks of you as a hero and the currency that these heroes work on is Kleos, fame, mm. if people talk about you as a hero, maybe it's, that's all that matters. It's very, because, you know, if, even if you look at the statues, which are very, you know, men posing in their bronze, going, I am the most muscly and the most trained and everything else. Mm. It's very Instagram. <laughs> the yes. whole thing yeah, is very, very performative social, culture. Yeah, yeah, performative, you know, social media. And we're kind of spinning back to it. Yes, perhaps we are. I think, yeah, our body ideals have maybe become Trump. equally oh. implausible um, as theirs. Because if you look at Greek statuary for men, it's particularly unreasonable. That there's a... Uh, I'm not saying it because you'll go and Google it and it's absolutely <laughs> filthy. But there's, um, a, I think it's called an Apolline girdle or something like that, an Adonis girdle. But there's a, a weird bit of muscle here that men have on Greek statues, um, which a, a real human person, no matter how much they worked out, no matter how many steroids they took, 
could never achieve. Mm. But it's it's an artistic ideal. The body image for men in ancient Greece was absolutely brutal. Ridiculous. Um, it really. I mean, you have to assume that lots of people didn't meet it. Socrates famously says he looks like Silenus, the satyr, because he's got a snub nose and he's little. Um, but yeah, the it, I'm not sure we're necessarily gaining if we're trying to get ourselves back to that. No, no, I don't think we are at all. It's just it's just fascinating to me that they're this whole thing because now you you know no 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 news is bad news or you know no press coverage is bad and all the rest of it yeah it's all about attention yeah attention and that's exactly what you're describing yes yeah i mean it's a very troubling culture to us i think and and as you say the fact that we seem to be pursuing it isn't necessarily a good thing because that's sort of totally amoral just talk about me it doesn't matter how the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about um then yeah, it sort of does. It's very hard for us to shun a couple of millennia of Judeo-Christian conditioning and just say, yes, you're right, everything, any kind of talking is fine. Because it's sort of, it's not to us, is it? We still consider people to have a kind of inner life and inner goodness that's important. But the, the Greeks would have had no sense of that. They don't have language for that kind of psychological phenomenon at all, which is why so often when people behave in a way which is inexplicable, you attribute it to a god rather than to yourself. So when somebody falls in love inexplicably in Greek and later in um, Roman myth, um, it's because, you know, you've been punctured by an arrow from Eros, Amor, um, the, uh, or, or, you know, Aphrodite has done something to you. It's an external force applied to you rather than coming from inside. Which, yeah. So the That's gods serve quite a complicated psychological process. And I think, I think hopefully they're not waking up. Ha, huh, yeah, no, I think they <laughs> must have other things to do by now. Hopefully. Right, I've taken up plenty of your time. I have That's awesome, all right. Awesome times. Oh, you've got the dentist talking about bravery. I do have the dentist, but my Jeez. dentist is lovely, so it's all fine. Okay, good. And um, just so we're sure, it's uh, 1,000 ships av- available now. With what's yes. your publisher? It is with Pan Macmillan. Pan Macmillan, and it is brilliant. Thank you. I like her other... Children of Decast is very good, but this one's better. This one is better. This, anyway, this one's better. my heart song. <laughs> So there you have it. Go and buy uh, A Thousand Ships by Natalie Haynes. It's out with Pan Macmillan. Uh, please do it because she's lovely and um, you will, your mind will be blown. Your world will be turned topsy-turvy and uh, you won't feel guilty about taking revenge on people. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you very much for supporting uh, the Z-List, Dead List. Um, all of those of you who donate, it does make a huge difference. Thank you. I um, Hopefully, we're going to stick with the ancient theme. Hopefully, um, I've got an interview lined up uh, to talk about barbarians and general furry people. So enjoy. Um, until then, I hope you have an excellent lunch. Lunch? Yeah, I hope you have an excellent <laughs> Oh dear, I'm hungry. Can you tell? Um, An excellent month. There we go. And I will see you next month. You've been listening to the Z-List Deadlist podcast with me, Izzy Lawrence. To find out more, please visit izzy.com. That is I-S-Z-I dot com. To support the show, share this episode with your friends and on social media. Also, check out Izzy Lawrence page. That's Izzy Lawrence UK um, on Facebook. And um, I'm updating that quite a lot. See you next month.